Okay. Okay, to everyone. As we prepare to um, gather our hearts and our love and our memories together, we invite you, please, if you have a cell phone, to turn it to the silent mode. I'm Rabbi Brian Beal. I'm joined by Cantor Stewart Binder. On behalf of our leadership and our entire congregation, Bruchim Habayim, blessed are all who come on this morning to honor Bob's memory. To begin our ritual, I want to please invite Judy and Eric to rise, and the rest of the family, if you wish, to gather around them. The first ritual that we share can be performed any time from the death of a loved one all the way up until we begin the service. It's called Kriya, means to tear, and the tradition comes from the book of Genesis, for we're told when Jacob learns of the death of his favorite son, Joseph, or so he thinks he's died, he's actually been sold off to slavery in Egypt. But with the news of the loss of someone he loved so deeply, we're told that he tore his clothing, a physical expression of that pain and that sorrow. And so our people has performed this ritual throughout the generations, as you will in just a moment or two. But I think there's also a contemporary meaning to this ritual, especially for the two of you. We know that when we have a piece of torn clothing like you'll soon have as an extension of your clothing in this ribbon, we can take it to a tailor and a tailor is able to make the clothing not only whole again, but in a lot of ways, it could even make it stronger than it was before it was ripped. So it is with the human heart. When we learn of the loss of a brother or a father or anyone that we love, we know that the heart is torn. And yet, over time, the heart has a way of healing itself even becoming stronger than it was before it was torn by something like the loss of a loved one. And yet we also know the heart has changed forever. In the case for the two of you, your brother, your father, in his own way prepared you for this moment. It was important to him. It was important to him to know that when the moment arrived, yes, it would be a loss, but he wanted you to know that he was ready. He wanted you to know that he would be fine and that he wanted the two of you and your extended families to be able to reflect on his memory as quickly as possible to continue to bring love and blessing and to let the pain of the loss subside. So to honor his wishes, that's what we will do. We will mark the moment, acknowledge the sorrow, but also celebrate his life. And I pray that in the days and weeks and months to come, that that ability to reflect and to do exactly what he wanted you to do will become easier a little bit each day, and that his memory will always bring you love and blessing each and every day to come. So we invite you, please, to tear the ribbon from the bottom. And as you do, to repeat after me. I'm going to ask you to help Judy do it, please. Perfect. If you repeat after me, Baruch Atah Adonai. Baruch Atah Adonai. Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Dayan. Dayan. Ha'emet. Amen. Blessed are you, eternal God, rule of the universe, judge of all truth. Amen. Amen. Please have a seat.
Shiviti Adonai Lenegdi Tamid Kimi Mini Balemot Lachen Samach Libi Vayagel Kvodi Af Besarish Kol Avetach Kilo Tazov Nafshi Lishol Loti Ten Chasid Chalirot Shachat Todieni orachaim sovas machot et panecha neimot bimincha netzach. Death has taken away Bob Sheffield. For Bob's love that united so many in life in which death cannot sever. For his companionship that was shared along life's path and which will always continue through the tenderness of memory. For the gifts of his heart and mind that brought joy and happiness and will always be a precious remembrance. For all these things and more eternal God, even in this moment of loss, we pause to give thanks. Thanks for a man who brought so much love to his family, to his friends, even to the stranger walking down the street. Thanks for his life and the light that he brought each and every day. In this moment of grief, we listen to the voice of our sacred scriptures that brings us the message of God's presence in our life, tells of our kinship with our creator, and light is in darkness, and joy is in sorrow, and life is in death. First, the words that were chanted by Cantor to begin from Psalm 16. I have set the eternal always before me. God is at my side, I shall not be moved. Therefore does my heart exult and my soul rejoice, my being is secure. For you will not abandon me to death, nor let your faithful ones see destruction. You show me the path of life. Your presence brings meaning and purpose to my life. And the words of Psalm 15, God, who may abide in your house, who may dwell on your holy mountain, those who are upright, who do justly, who speak the truth from their lips and within their heart, who do not slander others or wrong them or bring shame upon them, who scorn the lawless but honor those who have faith, who give their word and, come what may, do not retract, who do not exploit others or take bribes, those who live in this way, shall never be shaken. When a rabbi officiates at a funeral for a congregant's parent, often it is for someone who he does not know. Today, however, I join with all of you to honor the memory of someone who I did know. I was blessed with only four or five visits with Bob, and yet, as most of you have experienced, it was about 10 minutes into our very first conversation, we were already talking as if we had known each other forever. Bob was at once engaging and disarming, forthright and real, endearing, and yet a straight shooter, he was a say what you mean and mean what you say kind of guy with absolutely no pretense whatsoever. And even though he lived a rather simple life, every now and then he was able to throw you a curveball that you just never saw coming. One example, during our first visit, Bob of course decided to talk to the rabbi about his Jewishness and so he said to me, you know, I'm not really a very religious man. Rather, I just consider myself Jewish, spiritual, rather than ritually observant. 
A minute or two later, he shared that he just happened to have been the first president of Chabad of Sacramento. And then he pointed to a picture that I had not yet seen. See, there was this picture of Rabbi Schneerson, the last Rebbe of, Lubav of the Lubavitcher Hasidic dynasty, that was there hanging above his bed, Rebbe Schneerson with the dark black hat and the long white beard was there to look over Bob each and every day. Bob explained to me that there was a time when he was looking for a Jewish community where he could connect with people and have an opportunity to do things to help people in need. He came to know Rabbi Mendy Cohen, and the next thing you know, Bob is president of the first Chabad in Sacramento. Bob and Rabbi Cohen developed a sacred partnership and a friendship that lasted many, many years. And I know those who will speak this morning, I know that you will paint a beautiful portrait of Bob's life. And so with this in mind, I hope you'll allow me to just say a few words about what he shared with me about his final months since he moved back to New Jersey. Lisa, every single time we visited, I mean every single time, Bob would go on and on about all that you did for him, especially to move him back to New Jersey, making it easy and warm and welcoming, for him, that is, because he knew how much of your time it took and how much energy it took. And to tell the truth, he was a little bit guilty for that, and yet, Time and time again, he would say that his daughter-in-law was smart enough to become the CEO of any company out there and that they would be blessed to have you. He was so grateful for your love and your attention. And you made those final months for him much easier than he ever could have imagined. And Eric. Every single time he referred to you, he called you his sweet son. He told me that when you were age 15, he asked you directly when you were going to become a normal teenager and rebel against your parents. <laughs> In the end, he said, aside from not cleaning your room, you never did rebel. In fact, he actually called you the perfect son. Imagine a Jewish father calling his son perfect. <laughs> he told me that he felt blessed to spend those last few months near to you and Lisa and the boys and to have you at his side as the light of his life begin to, began to dim. He respected you as a father and he loved you as his beloved son. May his memory always bring you, Lisa, Matthew, Jason, and Mark, and your entire family, love and inspiration and blessing each and every day. And Judy, I know that your love for your brother runs long and deep. In your own words, just a few minutes ago, no one can ever know you like a brother who has known you since the very beginning days. I know that your love and affection for Bob ran very deep, not only for you for him, but he told me often from him to you. In fact, the very last time he and I were together, one of the few things he was able to share with me is how important it was that he was able to connect with you by phone during those final days, that you should always know how important you were to him and that distance would never, ever come in the way. I know that your love for your brother will always be a blessing, an inspiration, and to help fill your heart with love. The rabbis of old would ask, who is rich? They would answer, one who is content with his portion in life. In other words, 
one who appreciates those things and blessings that make up their life. Bob Sheffield never did possess financial wealth, and much of what he did have was spent on meals with family and friends and stuff to give away. But what I can tell you, because he said it to me directly time and again, is that on account of his family and friends, he considered himself a very lucky and blessed man. And therefore, I think, by that definition, will always be remembered as one of the richest men ever to live. Zichonu Levracha. May Bob Sheffield's memory always be a blessing to all who knew him and to all who loved him. As together we say. Adonai madam vate daehu ben enosh vate chashevehu adam lahevel dama yamav ketzel over baboker yatzit vechalak laerev yemolel viyavesh tashev enosh adaka vatomer shuvu vene adam Lu chachmu yaskilu zot yavinu lacharitam Ki lo vimoto yikach hakol lo yered acharav kvodo Shemor tam ure yashar Ki yacharit leish shalom Hode Adonai nefesh avadav velo yeshemu kol hachosim bo. Akol zaman ve'et l'kol chefetz tachat hashamayim for everything there is a season, time for every experience under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot that which is planted. A time to tear down and a time to build up. A time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance. A time to throw stones and a time to gather stones time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to discard, time to tear, time to sow, time to keep silent, and a time to speak. Friends, I cannot think of a more difficult time to speak than when gathering to honor the memory of anyone we love. And yet I know it's important for a number of members of the family to share words, to recap Bob's life and the blessings that he brought. So it's my honor to invite Eric, Bob's son, to share words on behalf of his beloved father. So thank you everyone for being here to celebrate Dad, to share stories, some funny things, and a bit about Dad's life. Now, as I was talking to the boys beforehand, if anybody feels the need to take a nap, Dad appreciated good naps, so I won't be offended and he would be very proud. Um, so Dad and Judy grew up in Mattapan, and I don't know if people know this, but they were born as Scheinfeld, S-H-E-I-N-F-E-L-D. Grandma and Grandpa decided to make a change in 1946, and Judy and I were talking about it last night. It's kind of hard, right? Start as one name, change to another, right? Women are accustomed to doing it when they get married, but it was uh, right a change, but Grandpa thought it would be kind of better for uh, 
business and everything else, right, going into uh, kind of the rest of life. So um, I kind of say grandma and grandpa were both characters, right? That's a whole separate discussion, right? We won't go down that path, but I want to say that um, as we were kind of talking last night, the wonderful things they gave us are Judy, right, and Dad. So thanks, Grandma and Grandpa, for that. Um, when Dad was young, he spent a lot of his free time with his friends like Billy and Marty and Stanley, Cousin Bert. He shared a lot of funny stories. Um, in the end, Dad outlived almost all of them, and they kind of joked when he was younger that, you know, Bob, you're going to outlive us all, and he's like, never going to happen. Well, other than Bert, right, it happened. Um, Dad went to Boston Latin, learned the classics. They tried to teach him handwriting, but he was a lefty, and they forced him to write as a righty, and so his handwriting was worse than any doctor you'd ever seen. <laughs> he went to BU. Um, he was ROTC, R-O-T-C, now I'm in college. And he started out in the Army, ROTC, and then somebody showed him the light, and he switched to Air Force, and they said, you're better off flying over it than walking through it. And he, he loved to share that story, but he's like, you know, that makes sense. So he switched to Air Force. Um, Dad was stationed in Europe, and he served about three, two and a half years um, of active duty. It was right at the end of the Korean War, but he spent most of his time in Austria, then Germany, then Paris. Um, he met his longtime friend Don and so many wonderful people, and he would share stories with me about when he was in the service, um, the kind of the crazy things that went on, the things that you really can't make up, how the Russians listened to all of their phone calls, because where they were in Wiesbaden, in Germany, the Russians were right outside of the fence, watching them, listening to them, one day they all came in with machine guns and they were looking for someone and dad said they were not about to get in their way. So, um, and in true fashion, dad was responsible for the payroll for the entire base and armed guards would take him, they would drive to the bank, pick up the money, bring him back to the base where he would literally be handing out the payroll every two weeks. So, um, he was the last American to walk off the joint base in Wiesbaden, Germany and he talked about kind of handing the keys over, literally the last American to leave the base. When dad was in Europe, he collected a lot of stuff, right? And um, that's where he kind of became a collector, but dad brought back a lot of different things, vases, bowls, candlesticks, you name it. Um, he was shipping back, right? Judy boxes would show up all the time with things. So I think that's where dad's love of garage sales and collecting stuff started. <laughs> Not long after coming back from the service, thanks to Grandma Rose and my Aunt Martha, um, dad and mom met. My mom did not know she was meeting my dad that day, so she was pissed <laughs> when dad showed up at the house, but it worked out. Um, and after six months they were married, and first there was Margie, then there was me. Um, some dear friends from River Edge, you know, are here today. Mom and Dad started out in Fort Lee, and then they bought the house in River Edge, and um, made wonderful friends, and Dad was on the school board, and called bingo, and men's club, but always serving the community. Dad always loved to serve the community and help out with things. He also loved to be with the family, right? Being with Judy and Shell, and Sarah, and Ann, and Scott, and Mom's family, and Jerry, and Gabby, and everyone. Everybody in Boston, he did not like the car rides to get there and made sure we all knew it. Um, but he also loved the weekly phone calls, right, with Judy. So Judy and Dad knew no matter what, right, one of them would call just to check in. And um, that was it, right, just checking in to hear your voice, right? He just wanted to hear your voice or you wanted to hear his. It's the same with me. Um, Dad had kind of an interesting, I say, professional career. He worked in ad specialties. We kind of called it tchotchkes, right, anything pens, printed. One of Dad's dear friends, Bob, is here today. Um, he worked for the same company for over 25 years in Boston, and he was proud that he worked as a commission salesman, never, never a paycheck, just as commissions, and you know, he worked for, for years doing that, um, and he made lots of great friends like Bob and Chuck and Haskell and hundreds of people. And Dad had the chance to actually see the world because every year they would do these sales incentive trips that his company would run or the association, and he would always get to go, and Dad was always happy being one of the hosts, the perennial host, right? Taking people around, he and Billy, right, Bob? Um, he was proud of his work, um, and kind of as a funny note, and Bob, you can probably attest to this, as a result of Dad's work, we were never allowed to buy pens or coffee mugs in our house growing up. Um, we had them everywhere, um, but they would all say, courtesy of so-and-so. We should have actually had some made up for today, right, in the Dad's honor. Um, at 53 years old, Mom and Dad kind of went their own ways, and Dad moved to California um, to start a new life, and you know what, we were actually, we were happy for them, because Better to be happy apart than not happy together. And um, I remember the first time Dad had only been out in California a couple of months. And, you know, I called him and I said I wanted to see him. And this was on a Friday. He said, when are you thinking of coming? I said, well, there's a flight that gets in tomorrow morning. So he said he spent the next 12 hours, and he told me the story, cleaning up his place because it's the first time he had a bachelor pad 
in his whole life. He said he had never lived in a place on his own, and he could leave it as he wanted to. He went a bit wild with things, and you know what? That was his time to kind of do that. Um, over time, Dad made it north to Sacramento with Pat and continuing to add specialties. And um, his biggest pride in business there was he landed the Money Store, which was a, a banking lending company. And he grew that account, and he was always proud. He grew that account from nothing to hundreds of thousands of dollars a year until they found out it wasn't exactly the kind of company that it should be, and it was closed down by the government. <laughs> that is a true story. And there went Dad's biggest account, and that was kind of when he went into retirement. Um, but believe me, we still have money store pens and mugs and stuff sitting in his apartment. Um, when Dad went back to Sacramento, when he moved to Sacramento, he and Margie kind of rekindled their relationship, but it was really more as friends than father and daughter. Um, they kind of took care of each other. My sister had kind of the same twisted uh, sense of humor as Dad, and they had laughs, and they were both night owls and had late nights together. And they would call me and tell me their escapades from the night before, and I would just shake my head, like, and right? And I'd be like, oh my gosh, like, what are you two doing? Um, you know, when Dad lost a piece of himself when Margie passed, but 15 years goes quickly, so hopefully they're up there hanging out at, uh, you know, 7-Eleven together like they used to do at 4 in the morning when neither one of them could sleep. <laughs> since we all, you know, since, since they met, Lisa, Dad, had a special love for his favorite daughter-in-law, right, as he called you, um, and you would have fun together, right, and um, you knew how to hit, push his buttons and have fun with him, and he to you. He was proud of the boys and loved living through them. Matthew, the first grandchild, he always tracked your business and your, es I'm going to call them escapades, through Lehigh to New York City, the funny moments, the proud moments, the ones that you only tell your parents after it's all taken care of, exactly. <laughs> Jason, you would call him on your way back and forth to Delaware, sharing stories of your EMT calls, taking care of him here, going over and fussing over him, making sure that he was comfortable, making sure that the nurses and doctors, sorry, Leslie, at Bear Creek, were, you know, on top of things, and you'd always fuss around with him. And Mark, you'd call Grandpa and give him those quick hellos. I've got a great picture of you guys sitting on the couch together when he came for your bar mitzvah, and the two of you were snuggled on the couch and always could get a hug, and he would love hearing about crew, and then he'd be like, how does he go from school to crew to homework? I could never do that. Um, Dad celebrated all the boys' bar mitzvahs right here on this bima. So I'm proud of the fact that he was here with us and, um, you know, he's kind of here with us today, you know, in spirit. Um, Lisa, you're always checking on Dad, making him mandel bread. If he got a box from New Jersey, he'd be sad if it was empty or didn't have mandel bread in it. Um, and you always looked after him in a house that was full of boys where we didn't think of a lot of the, the things that would be meaningful. So thank you, sweetie. Dad moved to the Einstein Center. Um, I don't know, 10, 12, or 14 years ago or so, a residence, and it was the best thing for him. People, he met friends, people looked after him, he looked after them. Um, I'm told by some of his friends, and a couple may be watching today, that um, he added a lot of fun in life to the Einstein Center. Fashion shows, Halloween costumes, practical jokes, New Year's Eve parties. I didn't know when I was younger that my dad was gonna be the life of the party. Um, and one of the pictures out front, was from a uh, Halloween party they had that shows dad dressed up as a mafia boss. And to me, it just like kind of typified like the sense of humor. Um, and dad loved to meet younger people, I say, who became dear friends. Um, I say nothing personal to the old folks, he would say, but I like the younger ones better. <laughs> Moving back to live near us in February, I think was the best decision for all of us. Um, and I want to kind of share some quick thank yous on behalf of dad and myself. Lisa's the reason we went to California last December, and that's what tipped him over the edge. Right, to come back to Jersey. I was like, oh, I'll go spend a few days with him. She's like, let's all go. We'll make it fun. We'll go to Napa and entice him with a couple of days in wine country with the boys. Um, so um, you persisted. And by the boys being with him and all of us, that's what tipped him over the edge because you guys fussed over him and made jokes with him at his expense, by the way, which he was proud of, and made him see that he needed to be near us. I want to thank his friends in Sacramento for the past uh, 25, 30 or so years that you all kept tabs on him which let me keep tabs on him because I was 3,000 miles away. So none of you ever complained about my phone calls or emails or texts or little private calls to tell me about something I needed to look into. Thank his lifelong friends for keeping him kind of up in the good times, you know, having enjoying the good times, but also keeping him going through the bad times. And he's got some friends here that have been 30, 40, 50, you know, plus years. I want to thank everybody who made it possible for Dad to move back to New Jersey because, honestly, it truly takes an army at a village. He had a lot of stuff in his apartment, by the way. Um, so thank you everybody that made it possible for Dad to come back here. The amazing people at Bear Creek and a couple of the people that work there and residents are here with us today because 
everybody there made a difference. And it didn't matter, I say, the job, the person, just everybody made it a community for him. And dad felt welcome from the moment he walked in. And that's when I could relax and know that you're in the right place. To the wonderful people at Homeside Hospice, who for the past three or four months have been doing things that I never could have, and um, just making sure dad was comfortable, including a little kiss on the cheek sometimes when they'd walk in and he'd say, give me a, you know, a little kiss. Our friends in Beth Hayim community, Cantor, Rabbi, everybody here who have been here for us, our friends in the men's club, Rabbi Beal for getting to know dad and caring enough to help us through this time, but truly getting to know dad. Um, you truly did. What you said was perfect and you wouldn't have known it unless you spent time with dad. And our family and friends who are here with us today and every day. So I kind of did a little top 10 list, right? Many things to thank dad for. Keeping me company on the drive home from work. That hour and a half would have been a lot longer if part of it wasn't spent with dad. Telling me about everybody in Sacramento and who did this or what they had for dinner. It didn't matter what we talked about, right? Love of garage sales and unnecessary crap in the house. <laughs> I thank him, Lisa Kersison. <laughs> the, simple, the simple pleasure of a cold beer. Uh, a while back, Dad just wanted a beer, and Dan will appreciate this. So I popped a beer, gave him, I don't know, a mouthful or two at most, and the simple smile on his face, and he was just, he said, mmm, and just the smile was, I couldn't have, I don't know, it was just perfect. Um, Dad loved a nap, so I say the gift of a nap. Um, the gift of gab, which Dad has passed on to me and some of the boys and so forth, but Dad could talk to anyone, any place, so thank you, Dad, for that. The gift of knowing how a $10 bill gets things done when there's a long line, you don't feel like waiting. <laughs> the gift that knowing a blue blazer and slacks and a nice tie is what he called the most dapper combination and that was dad's favorite. Thanks dad for not telling mom we had a lot of pizza at Mazzone's at four o'clock in the afternoon and then mom didn't know why we weren't hungry for dinner. <laughs> but that was the fun stuff that dad and I would do together. Bike rides in Vance on, pancakes at the diner. And he always knew when something was on my mind or something we needed to talk about. Didn't matter what I said to him in terms of I'm good or whatever, he always knew that there was something on my mind and be like, I had a feeling we needed to talk about that. Um, so dad was kind of wild, I say, in a quiet sort of way, and I think I really kind of picked that up from him. Um, so I hope dad is up there hanging out with Margie, his lifelong friends, long gone family, having a cold beer and sharing inappropriate jokes, which would be his happiest way. I hope the constant ringing in his ear because he had tinnitus is gone and that it's quiet. So kind of in typical Bob fashion, his dad would say, bye bye and bye bonds. So thanks everybody for being here to celebrate Dad. We continue with the 23rd Psalm, first in Hebrew, and then together in the English as it will appear on the screen before us. Adonai roi lo echsar Vino teshe yar vitseni al mei menochot Yenaleni Nafshi eshovev Yancheni v'magalei tzedek leman shemo Gam ki elech begeit san mavet lo irara ki yata imadi shibtecha umishantecha heima yanachamoni taharoch lefanai shulchan neged sorerai di shanta vashemen roshi kosir vaya ach tov chesed yerdefuni Kol yemei chayai V'shavti b'vet Adonai L'orech yami A Psalm of David together. God is my shepherd, I want for nothing. You make me lie down in green pastures. You leave me beside still waters you restore my soul. Even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the eternal forever. 
representing Bob's grandchildren, Mark, Jason. We invite Matt, Matthew to share a few words. Grandpa was never tuxedo. He was always dapper in his own way. So we'll play it off like it was intentional. So when Grandma passed away last year and I was standing up here, I made a joke about the length of Dad's speech. And I promised I wasn't going to do another one this year. <laughs> it's OK. On behalf of Jason, Mark, and I, I just want to say a few words about Grandpa. My dad covered the basis in terms of walking through Grandpa's amazing life. And so we just want to talk about his amazingly unique personality. Grandpa had this amazing ability, as everyone here knows, to strike up a conversation with anyone and everyone. If you got into an elevator with him, you left knowing his life story and he yours. We always loved listening to these stories. Grandpa's life was incredible, from his time in the service to the years over which he sold several million mini calendars to Manischewitz, which I <laughs> definitely spelled wrong in these notes. <laughs> And everything in between and thereafter, he made an art out of first impressions and introductions. This is a gift that I see has been passed down to my dad, and with any luck, all three of us. It's hard to stress how incredible of a person Grandpa was. Everyone around him loved him, because what's not to love? I'm amazed he wasn't a doctor. My dad already touched on this. We didn't get to coordinate notes. But <laughs> he had an incredible bedside manner. He knew how to make everyone laugh, despite Counting decades of pen sales, he still did have chicken scratch for handwriting. <laughs> when we would fly out to the Einstein Center in California, everyone there would exclaim when we introduced ourselves as Bob Sheffield's family. It was a big ordeal. Apparently, they were all up to date on all the developments in our <laughs> lives. <laughs> no, no secrets whatsoever. And that's the thing, despite being a few thousand miles away, Grandpa was always an unabashedly proud father and grandfather he relished in sharing our accomplishments, and I never ended a call with him prior to him reiterating how proud he was of me and all the family multiple times. The last six months or so, we had the privilege of having Grandpa move back to West Windsor, and we spent more time together. He loved to live vicariously through the stories that Jason, Mark, and I told him. When I would tell him stories about work, I was reminded of the fact that he was actually the first one to teach me about negotiations. In the spring, when Grandpa used to fly out to Jersey, he would take us all to the garage sales that I was talking about, where he not only had an eye for the hidden gems, but he also knew how to drive a very hard bargain. I think they would just basically do it for free at that point, just have us leave. <laughs> so uh, yeah, he really did. When I was 12, he once found a Polaroid land camera, for example. He paid 50 cents for it. We flipped it on eBay for 42 bucks together. <laughs> and that was the start of it all. He was always enterprising, and he instilled that in us. And that was the start of this whole phase, but ultimately just an example of the one of the many things that Grandpa instilled in me. Additionally, we all had the opportunity to really get to know Grandpa's stories, all three of them. <laughs> While we enjoyed getting to hear about all of these amazing places and things he had done, there's never a great time to hear about your Grandpa's intimate life with his lady friends. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, I cherish that he was around and close by to share all of these with us, because they truly are amazing stories that I will carry me forever. I'm wrapping up, but I wanted to close with some words of comfort courtesy of Jason. Despite not being here to be with us now, we take solace knowing that Grandpa's up there, reunited with Aunt Margie, and more importantly, Grandma Fran. <laughs> We invite Bob's nephew, Peter, to share a few words on behalf of himself, and I know Sarah and Anne as well. Can you hear me OK? Can you hear me better here? Yeah. Oh, good. OK, so much better. This is actually uh, the words of my sister, Anne, who's living in Monterey, California, and is sorry that she can't make it here. So I'm basically uh, speaking for her. She may be watching our video. I'm sure she is. 
I hope I don't embarrass you too much, Ann. Um, I'm sorry I can't be with you in person this morning to remember and honor Uncle Bob, but I'm pleased to be watching on YouTube and you can't see me, but I can hear, see and hear you. I'm gonna miss Uncle Bob, although I didn't see him that frequently. As one of his few California relatives, I saw him more often than did many others in the family. We had a strong bond and he was one of those people who always made me feel special and loved. It's hard to lose someone like that. We connected most strongly many years ago when I was in Florida with him and my mother, his sister, during the final days of their mother's, my grandma Rose's, life. We spent many hours together talking over coffee or drinks, taking long beach walks, and going through grandma and grandpa's stuff storage units. There's a theme there. <laughs> Uncle Bob had a phenomenal memory, and if he were here, he could, and would, tell you in great detail exactly what we had found in each storage unit and what we did with each item and what we talked about during those days together. My memories aren't as specific, but one thing has stayed with me all these years, and that, it is what, and that, it was, and that is that it was during this time that he began fondly calling me Generale because of my insistence on promptness and my attempts on keeping us on task. Uncle Bob was handsome and charming, and although he was talkative, he was also a very sensitive and caring person, and was a good listener, too. Because of this, he made friends easily, and he almost always also had a lady friend. I'm enjoying imagining him schmoozing with old and new friends wherever he is now. I'll miss Uncle Bob, as I know you all will, too, but I'm glad to have these and other memories of him and appreciate the opportunity to have shared them with you this morning. Thanks. Friends, I invite you to take just a moment or two for silent reflection meditation to continue the eulogy for Bob in your mind and your heart, recalling, I hope, one or two moments that he inspired you to bring goodness to this world. For when we do continue to do just that after someone has departed, then their life continues to have meaning and purpose long after their days on earth. A moment or two of silence. Friends, following the service, the family will return to the home of Lisa and Eric, where they will receive people through 3 p.m. and again this evening from 6 to 9 p.m. and tomorrow evening from 6.30 to 9 p.m. The Shiva Minion will be held in their home each of the two evenings at 7.30 p.m. If there are those who wish to honor Bob's memory with an act of tzedakah, the family is asked that you consider a charitable donation to Congregation Beth Chaim, Jewish Family and Children's Service of Greater Mercer County, or the not-for-profit of your choice. We ask following the service here in the sanctuary for you to please remain in your seats until the family in the front row recesses out into the lobby to give them a moment to exit the sanctuary. We rise together. El malerachamim shochein b'amromim hametzei menochan echona tachat kanfei hashchina im kedoshim u'tehorim kezohar harakiyam azir. Et nishmat Baruch Yitzchak shalach l'olamo Baal harachamim Yastirehu b'seter knafav l'olamim Bitzror bitzor hachaim et nishmato 
Adonai hu nachalato. Vianuach b'shalom al mishkavoch venomar. Amen. Compassionate God, eternal spirit of the universe, grant perfect rest in your shelter and presence to Bob Sheffield who has entered eternity. O God of mercy, let him find refuge in your eternal presence and let his soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. God is his inheritance. May he rest in peace. As together we say. Amen. Friends, one last ritual, one last blessing that we share here in the sanctuary. The mourner's Kaddish is said in memory of a loved one who is no longer with us during Yiskor, four times a year, during Kaddish, and with their immediate loss. And yet despite being about death, it never mentions death in its words, but rather praises God for the gift of life. Could there be a more perfect prayer at this moment than one that gives thanks to God for every gift that Bob brought to this world, to the love he brought to family and friends, to the light that he brought to the life around him. And so the obligation to say Kaddish according to Jewish tradition lies with Eric and Judy, but in our tradition we invite all who wish to say it along with them to give thanks for the gift of life. For those who wish, we join together with the words on the screen in front of us. Yitkadal v'yikadash mirabah V'yalma divrach e'utei v'yamlich malchutei V'chai echon v'yom echon V'v'chai d'chol b'ch Yisrael V'agala v'zman kari v'yimru Yehei shemei rabba m'varach l'olam olamei almaya Yitbarach v'yishtabach V'yipa'ar v'yitramam v'yitnasei V'yitadar v'yitale v'yitalal Shemei d'kudisha b'richu Le'ela mi kol birchata v'shirata, tushpechata v'nechamata, tamiran ba'alma v'imru. Yehei shalom araba min shamaya, v'chayim aleinu v'yal kol Yisrael v'imru. Ose shalom b'mnumav, hu ya'ase shalom, aleinu v'yal kol Yisrael v'imru. May God, who grants peace on high, bring comfort and love, to all who mourn, comfort to all who are bereaved, as together we say. Zichano Levracha, may the memory of Bob Sheffield always bring blessing, light, and love long after his days with us. Amen. Tainai el harim me'ayin me'ayin yavo ezri ezri me'im Adonai ose shamayim shamayim ba'aretz alite. Lamot raglecha, lo yanum shomrecha. Hine lo yanum. Velo Yishan Shomer Yisrael Adonai Shomrecha Adonai Tzilchal Yad Yeminecha Yomam Hashemesh Lo Yakeka Veyareach Balayla Adonai Yishmar Chamikora Yishmor et nafshecha Adonai yishmar tzedcha uvoecha Me'ata, me'ata Me'ata ve'ata
yeah, yeah, older yeah. woman that looks a little frail there. Yeah, yeah, who are there? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I put the cost of the Thank you.